I could keep showing you these pictures and enthusing about the elemental nature of the experience, and you might pick up on my enthusiasm, but you'll quickly bore of the photographs themselves. Other people's holiday snaps simply don't do it. They fail to communicate important aspects of the encounter. The photographic records, or pictures, take me back to the experience and standing in front of the scene, i.e. they're an aid to the retrieval of the experience from memory. However, the pictures don't contain the information for me, just as they don't for you. So the question is, what are they lacking? What is the information that our current information technologies fail to convey? Is the deficit evident in optical projection related to a created facet of perception, or do we, as the receiver, take more from the electromagnetic radiation or light coming from the scene? The full saliency of vision is actually a mixture of both these factors. It's not a resolution issue for sure. Improving or retuning our instrumentation is not going to make up for the experientially realised deficit. It's also not covered off by the absence of the binocular element of vision. The specific set of factors referred to here are far more generic and apply equally well to our presentations of monocular vision as to binocular. Vision is non-photographically rendered. The phenomenon is not set out in terms of what we understand of as optical projection. Visual process has next to nothing to do with the transference of a retinal picture to conscious perception. In fact, vision space demonstrates that there is no information structure blur in vision. No motion blur, no depth of field. There aren't any pictures, no picture frames, no exposure times, and no frames per second. As there are no pictures to call up, binocular advantage is not realised through pictorial fusion. We do not encounter the world in the way that the optics of the camera sets it out. If we want our information display systems to engender experiential reality, we need to understand the fundamentals of perceptual structure that we as biological systems generate, and through that, how to artificially engender the human unwelt. Only by accurately rendering the phenomenon will we render visible the differential between pictures and images. Understanding images will tell us a good deal about visual process, and what characterizations to look for as it's studied. So the scientific study will enable us to establish how it is that the phenomenon is generated, not how notional pictures are relayed. Trying to sort these issues relating to the structure of images has been a preoccupation since the cave painters, and even before that as humans shaped tools and started to encounter differentials between the physically real and the perceptual reality we form from engaging with it. As we look all over the photos of the scene and retrieve the detail that the optics of the camera records, we can't appreciate the same implicit spatial context that occurs to us in front of the real setting because its records don't contain the information. The device was not invented or developed to either encounter or engender this data potential. In the vision space paintings, we do encounter some references to the missing spatial values because we are aware of this implicit content and artists have developed some strategies to render it. So the deficient design of our recording devices and the limitations in the ontology that created them is in part accountable for the deficit. However, there are other issues remaining that can only be attributed to a created saliency or facet of perception developed by the perceiver as part of visual process and linked to our intent in the world. Vision is a relationship we form with the real and we can now look more closely at the particular issues presented in this triptych. I make three fixations within the observed panorama. In executing the triptych in the studio I refer to drawings carefully compiled over many visits and directed to pursue specific questions. We need to consider intuitive records as containing measurements. They're not merely subjective inventions to be discarded by virtue of them having been observed and recorded by the sentient being to which reality occurs. Quite the opposite. It's the validity of the camera's mechanical records that must be qualified. They are not the records of a sighted sentient being and do not neatly perform some assumed hypothetical third-party observer function on our behalf. 
In previous presentations, we've looked at some length at implicit spatial awareness and the field structure that underpins perceptual structure. There are just a couple of additional points that I wish to state more clearly. The assertion is that perceptual structure is based on an all possibilities field, with the field set out from fixation. Individual spatial values are resolved in very small areas, effectively collapsing all possible values to just one for a limited, if not fleeting, moment of time, hence the noisy feel. Needless to say, these small areas are not related to pixels held in a grid formation and are more likely to be related to neuronal receptive fields and even the group responses of neurons. The grain that I achieve as an artist with just a handful of brushes is many orders of magnitude too coarse, but there we are. Across the entire field, spatial values are resolved in context to the underlying field potential. So here, as we build the field set out from fixation, the underpainting of the all possibilities field still resonates under those temporary resolving values. You may notice that where the resolving values contain light tones, the underpainting of the all possibilities field is set on black, and vice versa. This helps us appreciate the spatial value being articulated. The spatial value resonates against the field structure. Experientially, we rarely encounter either the field structure or become aware of the emerging and vanishing values. As intended, we are only aware of the evaluations or outcomes taken from the presentation system where we form an essential part of that system. In generating images, however, we do need to supply or render visible in the display aspects of the background perceptual system in order to appreciate the emerging perceptual context. So we need to move from a picture posting system to systems generating the realities of image generation and which contain aspects of a perceiver's perceptual structure. It should be remembered that the phenomenon of vision is not about achieving effect. It's about relaying information about our relationship with the real. As such, vision space is not in competition with conventional cinematic 3D that seeks to make 2D pictures 3D. It's about replacing the structure of pictures with the data structures providing the information contained in images. We are looking for EXPD, the experiential dimension. In the presentation Exploring Implicit Spatial Awareness, I made the following assertions with respect to the setting out of the field structure in circumstances involving large distances. This is at best an atypical arrangement of the field structure. We should look to the line through fixation to establish the incremental increase in disorder from the point of interest. As the surface of the sea extends out from the fixation towards us, we should experience incremental ramping, but not for this to tunnel towards us, as this presentation suggests. Extending back from the fixation, the ramping and the disorder values will also increase. It's on this basis that the field structure is set out in the paintings from Kamastirak. This runs counter to the setting out used in the painting from the boat, and may be a straightforward error, but when executing this panel of the painting I was trying to reproduce an experiential realisation. Perhaps this arrangement is a form of inverse in the field, allowing us to assess the distant subject matter abstracted from context. This of course just remains a suggestion and it can only really be followed up in experimental terms when we have full computational control of the field structure in lab conditions. The other point with respect to the structure of the field is the rendition of the sky. Within the clear blue sky we can encounter the all possibilities field of perceptual structure, the basis of implicit spatial awareness. There is nothing here to register a specific spatial value. The sky exists at all points in space from us into the distance. It's a medium, ensuring that contextual vision is spatially textured. In a way, the sky isn't empty at all. It's totally full. Ringing any bells, physicists? It's also a critical, unifying factor for us as we encounter our environment. We have a ground zero that is with us at all times. Everything that will ever appear to us will appear within this space that we are generating. 
The only place that this structure doesn't dominate is within the confines of central vision, but even there, the explicit take on reality is presented within the field structure. In rendering the environment within the field structure away from central vision, the task is not one of replicating detail. It's one of validating the spatial value that an area is providing. Consideration about what is out there is secondary. Here we're primarily interested in establishing where we are in the world and the proximity of things around what it is we are attending to in central vision. Hence I'm not referencing the number of houses on the peninsula with each brushstroke. I'm indicating a spatial value, the positions the houses hold with respect to fixation. Hence when we look closely at the designated fixation points, we can investigate the immediate area around fixation while simultaneously and implicitly comprehending the basic spatial relationships across contextual space. In the painting, as a representation of perceptual awareness, we can address the field structure through central vision and explicitly appreciate the changes in spatial texture area by area. But this is not how we experience the field as we encounter the world. The implicit field structure presents in real time on a holistic basis. Here we are unaware of conceptual notions of texture, occlusion, object, etc. And this leads us to use words like covert and subconscious when fumbling for descriptions. The other element that I wanted to discuss here involves creative saliency. Just how is it that what we are looking at appears within the phenomenon of vision to be somehow proportionally bigger than it appears recorded in a photograph or seen in contextual vision? We don't experience some sort of magnification function within the phenomenon. There are obvious advantages in getting apparently closer to a distant object that we wish to comprehend, but how do we accomplish this without compromising the integrity and proportionality of the entire scene? The answer would appear to be that we stretch in the y-axis within the binocular zone of vision, which extends into contextual field. Critical to the process is our ability to understand space on an implicit basis, and not as the end product from a load of explicit processing. Within the Vision Space software tool, we facilitate this process by using radially structured depth maps, either from bespoke technology or by accessing the computer models. With this capability, all we then have to do is specify the extents. In the paintings, we can appreciate that doing so provides the advantage of increasing our potential to comprehend the scene without disrupting continuity along the x-axis. So this is not magnification we would detect or perceive the artifacts of that type of function more clearly. It would disrupt the continuity of the panorama. A small stretch in the y-axis, however, over a designated area, provides the best strategy. Once again, if we're not extracting and processing implicit spatial information streaming from an environment, we can't begin to perform these creative perceptual tasks. What the implicit system is telling us as we look at a materially flat photograph is that it's flat. No matter how hard we concentrate on the detail provided, the implicit space will not appear. Essentially the same is true as we look into a mirror. In executing the paintings, I do look closely at the photographs of the scene that I use to help with a colour reference and with the rendition of the basic topography from which I then depart as required. So the colours in the paintings are mainly courtesy of my printer technology. The overall aim here is to create experientially based stimuli that are as closely related as possible to the same subject matter captured by the optics of the camera. The paintings complete when the designated processes have been completed. The paintings work to the degree that we can use the information they contain as stimuli. As we have seen, much of the information contained in the paintings is absent in the photographic record. So photographs used as stimuli will fail to present what it is that we take from the environment on a visual basis, precisely because the devices that realise the records are not embedded within the environment as we are. This is true of all our information display technologies. They do not form a relationship with the real. They are not phenomenological in nature. They neither generate reality nor record it, so they do not communicate it. 
However inconvenient it may be, these mechanical records must not be allowed to stand in for us at any scale of inquiry without us first understanding the shortfall for what they fail to capture and so fail to communicate. There is nothing more fundamental than this realization. The assertion is that vision space presents us with images that are consistent with the fundamentals of perceptual structure. Vision space presents us with valid stimuli where the photograph doesn't. By developing and expanding the technology as a new form of illusionary space, it will be possible to formally explore and understand the human unwelt.